ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for the third panel, Creating Complexity for Current and Potential Rivals. In this panel, Colonel Retired Liam Collins and his panelists will answer the question, how can Special Operations Forces best create complexity for current and potential rivals during both competition and conflict? Colonel Collins is a Special Forces Qualified Officer who served in a, in a variety of Special Operations roles over the course of his long career. He holds a PhD from Princeton University and was the founding director of both the Combating Terrorism Center and the Modern War Institute at West Point. Colonel Collins, welcome, the floor is yours. All right, hey, thanks, Charlie. Just to set the record straight, I wasn't the founding director of the CTC at West Point, just uh, one of the directors along the way. So uh, I just don't, I don't wanna have uh, false advertising there, but uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. And, and we're just gonna kind of get right into it in terms of format. I'm gonna briefly introduce each of the panelists and then ask each of them to address the question that you, you just posed there. And then you'll see that each of them take a very different approach to answer this question. And, and then I'll pose questions to each of them, but I've saved plenty of time for the audience um, after their formal remarks. So as, they, as questions come to you as, as we go through this, and I encourage you to submit them uh, or, 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 or you know, keep track of them and uh, throughout the remarks and after they have finished speaking so we can include as many of you in discussion as possible. Uh, so the first one I'll be speaking will be Major Andy Maurer, who has served in the uh, Australian Army for 20 years and is taking leave in 2022 to complete his doctorate uh, examining proxy warfare. He has conducted multiple deployments to both Afghanistan and Iraq and has been a military fellow and postgraduate lecturer uh, with the University of New South Wales. He's also a visiting fellow with the Charles Stewart University uh, Terrorism Studies Program and a non-resident fellow with the Modern War Institute at West Point. And in 2021, he was an Australian uh, Chief of Army Scholar. Uh, the next speaker that we're gonna have will be uh, Lieutenant Colonel Megan Crumston, who's the G2 of the 1st Armored Division. She received her master's in international relations and international economics from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies as a, and was recently selected as a good pastor scholar and will pursue her PhD upon completion of her current assignment. Uh, Megan served in multiple army and, and joint uh, command and staff assignments, including five years with the Joint uh, Special Operations Command Intelligence Brigade. Uh, she previously taught in the Department of Social Sciences at West Point and is a 2009 recipient of the Douglas, uh, General Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award. She'll be followed by David Concullen, who is a professor of practice in the Center of Future War and a School of Politics and Global Studies and a senior fellow at New America, an author, strategist, and counterinsurgency expert. 25 years of service as an Army officer, diplomat, policy advisor for the Australian and United States government, and command and operational missions across the Mideast, Southeast Asia, and Europe. In the United States, he was chief strategist in the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau and served as in Iraq as a senior counterterrorism advisor to General Petraeus. He's also the author of uh, numerous books, which I'm sure many of our audience have read, including The Accidental Gorilla, Out of the Mountains, and Blood Year. And finally, uh, last but not least, will be Peter Klocher, who is the new Joint Special Operations University professor for Development and Human Security. He's a career foreign service officer in the United States Agency for Internal Development, or what most of us would call USAID, having served as the office uh, director for programs in Afghanistan, Mozambique, Angola, and East Timor for a total of 15 years overseas. So like uh, probably most of us in the army, as much time away from the headquarters as possible is best. And he's devoted much of his foreign service career to developing innovative strategies and advancing interagency partnerships in a range of technical fields. So. We'll turn it over to uh, Andy, so uh, we'll let you open up. Thanks, Liam, and uh, thanks also, uh, JCR, for inviting me to uh, uh, pose my comments. Um, what I'd like to start with is the, the question of what do we mean by a special operation? Uh, to me, special conveys uh, one of two things. Uh, firstly, unorthodox. This is something new. This is something elaborate. Perhaps it's innovative. Or special might also mean elite. It's something that simply must succeed. It demands the best people, the best technology, uh, the most effective tactics in order to complete it. Now, to me, the post 9-11 era has seemingly been characterized by a public eye focusing on an elite element of, uh, of SOF. This observation manifests in the support that we provide partner forces through capacity building. Um, typically making little direct action replicas of ourselves. Um, but it also carries a negative, um, that elitism 
um, may lead to moral drift and some of the other problems that have been associated with SOF over the recent years. So as we cast forward, I, uh, I look at this challenge by saying, how do we look at open source discussion of what might be unorthodox and therefore quite innovative when, of course, we're trying to protect some of those discussions? Uh, this is, of course, a challenge that uh, Dave Kilcullen um, and I have in trying to teach on a theory of special operations and, and drive our students forward into what it might mean for the future. Um, I've got a graphic that I've uh, sent through uh, to uh, support this discussion. And if I could have that pulled up in the background, please. Um, I'll start talking to it uh, concurrently. Um, I argue there's benefit in a, uh, a, a playbook approach to, uh, to looking at what the history of SOF has been before and therefore uh, what might uh, come next. Um, from this playbook, we could then extrapolate such tasks um, and cast forward to what it might mean uh, for today. Uh, an example of what I mean by this, uh, one of the tasks undertaken by the Brandenburgers in their advance through Ukraine in uh, World War II was seizing telephone exchange points and creating chaos in, uh, in Russian command and control. Well, 70 odd years later, Russian special forces emulated that play by seizing internet control point, uh, exchange points and in so doing, similarly uh, creating chaos throughout um, uh, command and control. By laying out types of tasks between unorthodox through to elite and from tactical tasks through to tasks that might directly serve uh, political leadership, there's uh, advantage in uh, in contextualising what our range of options might be. Let me uh, add some colour to that. So uh, unconventional warfare is, of course, a US doctrinal task, doesn't neatly transpose to other militaries. The Australian military, for example, does not include that as a tactical task. Um, but if we were to be looking at uh, the uh, more recent language associated with unconventional warfare of support to resistance movements, then today's information age conveys a, a lower barrier of entry to the provision of, uh, of support that um, had previously been pro uh, provided to certain uh, resistance movements. So for example, in World War II, BBC uh, News Network was utilised to help remotely coordinate and control uh, a vast array of actions across European theatre. Well, today, might similar effects be able to be achieved using internet uh, chat rooms or, uh, or other such uh, technologies? Uh, similarly, um, in Burma, uh, Special Operations Executive, SOE, agents worked with Indigenous tribesmen to uh, coordinate airstrikes in the, the rear of Japanese forces. Well, today, um, as we've uh, demonstrated through the conflict in uh, Iraq, there are aspects of open source intelligence platforms paired with remote advisors and assist kits that create that same effect distributed over a much larger area with a uh, much uh, reduced uh, risk to uh, force um, across, uh, across a greater depth of battle space. Expanding out more broadly, um, the ideas of economic warfare in World War II, this looked like seizure of, uh, of shipping uh, for the Italians in particular, the seizure of uh, roughly one third of their uh, merchant marine, put them in a serious challenge right from the outset. Taking this play and extrapolating to today um, posits a requirement for soft to be starting to look at where are those economic uh, assets of competitors or adversaries that um, might be impounded in non-permissive, uh, uh, sorry, in permissive countries or sabotaged, seized, destroyed in non-permissive countries. Um, I think this is a useful question for us to ask. Looking at political warfare now or grey zone activities, uh, World War II playbook draws our attention to the efforts of SOE to make contact with Romanian or Italian uh, leadership and encourage their defection from the Axis. Well, a contemporaneous extrapolation of that play 
might remain similarly focused upon the fishers within an adversary's country or alliance and draw PSYOPs resources to expand those fishes. So what? Well, in my mind, considering how complexity might be created into the future, I believe that there's utility for a playbook approach that is developed from our collective histories. Senior leaders will want options and in a globalized world that carries significant second and third order risk where we're looking to vertical escalation. Um, and indeed, I think the Russians are suffering through this right now. My uh, assessment of this is it will uh, create an increased demand signal for horizontal escalation options. Uh, policy uh, makers will be looking for this greater array of options that allows them to shift the geographic point of action from the, uh, the intended target uh, at which we're, uh, we're acting against. And to me, a playbook may help us to craft these comments to help create complexity. Back to you, Liam. Yeah, Andy, you talked a little bit about, you know, kind of historical things that the SOF has done in the past. So I guess we have a current competitor that's currently at conflict with Ukraine, not with us. So I guess I would ask, you know, based off of what they've done historically and kind of looking, what could SOF do right now uh, to, you know, to support Ukrainians, for example, support their effort? And what should they do, if anything, right? Clearly, we're providing you know, weapon support, um, obviously, right, a nuclear armed nation, we don't get involved in direct engagement, but if it's advising from afar, is that something that can and should be done now? But, you know, so what, what where do you see this if we're trying to create complexity for, for, uh, for Russia and Ukraine at the present? What do you see as some options they could do and what should they do? Um, Liam, one of the challenges when looking at this from an Australian point of view, of course, is Ukraine is a very long way away. Um, and so policymakers from Australia, from Singapore, Japan, other allies to the United States will be looking at, um, at the Ukrainian challenge and going, well, you know, how much can we do directly and how much should we do indirectly? Um, I would argue that from a US perspective, um, competition with Russia um, creates second order effects when looking outside of the Ukraine um, context. For example, the way in which the Wagner Group uh, doubled down in Mali in uh, a number of months ago, well, I look at that as that was the Russians responding to what they saw as Western influence and in so doing them trying to compete on a global scale. If some of the reporting is true that the level of conflict in the Ukraine has drawn Wagner back into, uh, into, the, U into the Ukraine and therefore uh, undermined their ability to compete at a global scale. Well, we should be aggregating that effect as part of our overall response to the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, in a similar way, the way in which uh, a, a number of nations throughout Europe and elsewhere have been seizing Russian assets, particularly relating to oligarchs, I look at that as a way of um, uh, manifesting that economic warfare element that I was talking about before. The challenge in my mind is, is that it is difficult for us to conceive that all of these actions are interlinked and in so doing part of the overall response. Um, uh, we generally tend to move directly to the kinetic and what's happening in a designate theater rather than looking um, at our uh, broader globalised scale. Uh, so to me, I think there's importance in looking to that globalised scale as part of our response. Thanks, Andy. I'll ask you one more and then we'll, we'll kind of move on to Megan. But, you, you know, you did, you're talking about like, ec right, influencing economics, right, political warfare, other aspects like that. And obviously SOF across the globe have, you know, pretty good interagency efforts, right? But how, how much do we need to, does SOF be need to become even more of a, you know, collaborated with interagency partners to have these kind of effects or, or is what our, our current collaboration sufficient? Uh, well, to me, that's again, interesting historical uh, precedent. Um, when Special Operations Executive uh, under the uh, UK banner was created, it was actually raised as part of the Ministry of Economic Warfare in an effort to emulate the same level of economic uh, constriction that uh, Britain was able to apply to Germany throughout World War I. It also aimed to 
leverage the lessons out of the uh, Spanish Civil War, the Chinese Civil War of the 1920s, um, and in so doing leverage irregulars in what we would today be calling uh, resistance movements or unconventional warfare. The very fact that at that time, the British recognised they needed a completely different minister from the Minister of Defence in order to manage this special type of competition is to me instructive of what it might mean for today. Uh, that means to me, hyper interagency is a requirement of SOF. If we're expecting to emulate similar options to government, uh, of engaging in political warfare, economic warfare, and support to resistance. Thanks, Andy. All right, uh, turn it over to Megan uh, and, and let, let you uh, provide some opening remarks. Hey, good morning to everyone from El Paso, which is where I'm currently stationed as the 1st Armored Division G2. And thanks again to JSAL for the opportunity to discuss this important question. Uh, Colonel Collins briefly mentioned my background, you know, spending time at the JSOC Intelligence Brigade and now transitioning to being the senior intelligence officer for an armored division. And so when thinking through this question, you know, what came to mind for me, uh, based on the premise that where you stand depends on where you sit, I think, you know, one of the best ways to increase complexity for our adversaries is to increase the operability between special operations forces and U.S. conventional forces and other partner nations. We've invested, you know, over the course of the last 20 years, uh, incredible, you know, effort into building relationships, something that the special operations community excels at with interagency partners, with multinational partners uh, across the globe, and really created, you know, a network uh, that enables us to get after problems. And I think that increasing that interoperability with our own sort of U.S. conventional forces, along with special operations forces who may be co-located on the battlefield, uh, would benefit, you know, and allow us to bring a, a increased effects, you know, for what we're trying to achieve in any given location. And when I talk about interoperability, that means a couple of things. Um, it's everything from intelligence uh, sharing to, you know, data to how we talk to each other. Uh, you know, we don't spend a lot of time training together, whether at, you know, the National Training Center uh, or JRTC at Fort Polk. Uh, so there's an education piece to it as well, where we need to talk through with leaders of both communities, uh, how to leverage the strengths and the capabilities that the special operations community brings to bear on a particular problem set versus the strengths and capabilities that an armored division may bring to bear on a problem set. So uh, that, that's kind of how I'm thinking through this. And you know, right now, uh, some of that interoperability or some of that discussion that takes place between the two communities is largely relationship-based. So it's easy for you know, someone who has been a part of the special operations community and who has come back out to the regular army to leverage relationships, friendships, you know, folks that you knew from deployments uh, and reach back into the community to discuss problems or equipment or things like that. Um, but it's not formalized, it's not process oriented. So in thinking through uh, how do we break down sort of our own bureaucracy in order to effectively leverage the strengths that we both bring to bear against, you know, complicated, complex battlefield problems. Um, I think there's a lot of room to grow across, you know, the military uh, to incorporate, you know, soft conventional forces plus, you know, uh, all of our partners and allies across the globe to really, you know, present multiple dilemmas for adversaries to have to deal with. Sir. Yeah, Megan, uh, thanks for reminding us how far we've advanced. I remember in 1994 when I was supposed to jump into Haiti, well, we flew halfway there and turned around and came back, and I thought that would be my only chance to jump into combat, but just one of my many times in my life I've been wrong. But I remember our battalion XO saying, hey, watch out for those SF guys. They're going to come in and steal our weapons and God knows what else or something. I mean, so there wasn't a whole lot of cooperation or coordination or understanding at that point. And obviously, 
we made great strides in progress during Afghanistan and Iraq, and we're losing that close kind of cooperation as, as you described. In some, some areas, obviously, those countries had better cooperation and coordination than others. Um, but I would ask kind of, uh, I think, in, you know, we can kind of think of potential areas where, as you say, how can we become better coordinated? I, I think we can see those kind of in conflict just based, of our, based off of our experience in Afghanistan and Iraq. But when it comes to, you know, creating complexity for potential rivals during, right, the competition phase, what we say is competition, right, our, our potential adversaries probably view it as we are in conflict. They don't have this dichotomy between peace and war that we have. And so how would you, what are some ways that, you know, it's a tough question, but what are some ways you could, uh, you would suggest to kind of create that complexity for them during, during the, you know, not, not stated conflict? So two things sort of immediately jumped to mind. Uh, the first is the intel sharing that I described. Um, so, you know, uh, basic intel sharing and creating a common intelligence picture between organizations, uh, even in, you know, a competition phase, I think is important because that's what sets the stage for success in the event that we transition to crisis and ultimately conflict. The other way I think that we do uh, increase complexity for our adversaries is by demonstrating this interoperability and this capability via training exercises uh, and via sort of routine engagements. The same sort of things that we do with multinational partners, um, you know, for the for the first armored division, we have a routine relationship with an armored division from the UK. Uh, so increasing the network of those relationships, you know, in training exercises, uh, both soft oriented or where soft is the primary training audience and where conventional forces are the primary training audience, I think, again, only serves to send a message, you know, implicitly and explicitly to adversaries that we are quite good at this and that we have set the stage uh, for anything that might come in the event that we have to transition into that crisis or conflict scenario. Yeah, thanks. And, and I guess, I mean, I could see opportunities for training, you know, at the kind of the combat training centers, we already have that at a lower level, you know, at Fort Bragg, Fort Campbell, it's easy to visualize or, or think of ways that we could do this, but right, you're there at, at whatever, Fort Bliss, I guess, with the one AD, what would you tell General Clark? Hey, this is what I think First AD should have in terms of what we need for training. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a potential engagement that we need to have beyond the intel kind of co collaborating that picture. But what would you tell General Clark? Hey, what do I need in terms of limited uh, soft assets to come to Fort Bliss and train with us? And what would that look like? So uh, not signing uh, Major General Bernabe, uh Iron Six up for anything necessarily, but what I would ask for is some of those unique and exquisite capabilities that SOF brings to the fight. Uh, so from a training perspective, we are co-located with the Joint Modernization Command uh, for experimentation and implementation. Uh, we host Project Convergence uh, here every year, which again offers the opportunity to uh, demonstrate how some of the future capabilities of the armed services for the United States can be leveraged, you know, in various scenarios. Um, I think that that's a relatively low cost way for special operations forces to be integrated uh, with some of the things that the First Armored Division is doing here, just based on sort of uh, where we're located, the fact that, you know, this is an excellent area for uh, controlling the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, large training area, big bullet ranges, uh, combined with some of the special effects uh, that SOF could bring to bear uh, based on uh, some of the capabilities that are unique to the special operations community. Thanks, Megan. We're going to turn it over to David, and, and, and you know he's going to bring a different perspective, right? You've got kind of the intel perspective and now with the conventional side and David's, you know, been floating around in state, army, all these different perspectives to kind of bring at the problem and, and from other nations as well. So David, interesting to hear your perspective on this question. Yeah, thanks, Liam. And, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to be very direct. You know, the question is, how do we create complexity for adversaries in the fourth age of SOF? And I think the way that I like to think about it is, is complexity as a subset of a broader category of costs. 
Um, I think many of you know Chief Warrant 5 Duke Duclos. Um, I want to acknowledge an intellectual debt to him here and also to uh, Professor Duan Lee from MPS, who a lot of you, I think, know as well. Uh, both of them in slightly different ways talk about this notion of cost imposition, the idea that you want to impose costs on an adversary across dimensions of time, space, and material. Um, and I'd urge everybody to look at Professor Lee's paper from last year at the uh, Modern Warfare Institute uh, website. I'm going to add a fourth category of reputation, right? So imposing complexity is a subset of imposing costs across those dimensions of time, space, material, uh, and reputation. In terms of time, uh, soft can disrupt adversary shaping activities, uh, throw a campaign uh, off tempo, require an adversary to take longer to plan and prepare, and hence um, increase the chance that those preparations are going to be detected, you know, left of boom. Um, during pre-crisis competition, just merely mapping an adversary's target set, even doing that in a relatively overt manner so that the adversary knows what you're doing, can create disruptive complexity and thereby increase costs for the adversary. Second dimension of space, soft are not uniquely, but certainly um, prominently able to pose a distributed threat across an entire non-linear battle space, including an adversary's uh, support areas, both physical and virtual. By operating in that diffuse, decentralized, uh, distributed manner, we pose a threat that can materialize anywhere, and hence the adversary has to defend everywhere. Um, and that imposes both complexity uh, and cost. And then the third dimension of material, obviously by doing both of those things, we're forcing the adversary to plan for higher human and material losses in the event of a campaign. And they've, they've, that means they need a larger capacity to achieve uh, a given effect. Um, and you're thereby imposing continuous costs on their material readiness due to the higher op tempo that you're imposing. You're also making them bring a bigger force to the gunfight, which means that it takes them longer to prepare, costs them more, uh, may actually have a deterrent effect um, and so on. And then to add the, the fourth element that I think we should also include is reputation. Um, adversaries in this environment, um, particularly uh, we've seen this in the case of Russia, Ukraine, but we're also seeing it day in, day out with China, Taiwan. They seek to intimidate and overawe uh, one of our partners or allies, or indeed our own political leaders, um, by producing this perception of invulnerability um, and sort of combat credibility. And one of the roles of soft is to attack that credibility, that reputation for uh, performance on the part of an adversary, embarrassing and humiliating the adversary as well as killing them. And uh, probably the, the classic recent example is uh, the Battle of Hostomel outside of um, uh, Kyiv on the very first morning of the current war between Russia and Ukraine, where a very small soft element partnered with a territorial force, massively disrupted um, the tempo um, and imposed space and material costs, but most importantly, destroyed the reputation for invulnerability that the Russians were seeking to create um, on that first morning of the war. Um, two more thoughts and I'll throw back. One is this notion of cross-domain coercion, which is a idea that comes from Dima Adamski, um, who's one of the leading analysts of uh, Russian hybrid warfare. The notion that you want to be able to dial pressure up or down across a range of military and non-military means or indeed what um, Chao Liang and Wang Sheng Sui, the authors of uh, Unrestricted Warfare, would call trans-military operations, uh, imposing uh, costs um, across those four dimensions um, through everything from economic to information to cyber to um, uh, conventional deployments uh, and so on. And um, I like to think about it as a graphic equalizer, right? We can dial up or down different elements within uh, a wider array of capabilities. And then the final point I'd say is, is uh, all of this relies on understanding the reaction parameters of an adversary in this form of great power competition. 
We need to understand um, where they're going to react, what form that reaction will take, um, when it's likely to happen, what duration it may last for, what authorities are going to be involved uh, in authorizing that by the enemy, who holds those authorities, all those critical elements of um, what you might call sort of gray zone intelligence mission data are actually critical to carrying out this kind of operation. Um, so I'll throw it back to you, Liam, but obviously can get into any any of that in much more detail. Yeah, yeah, I do have a question, David. It's a little bit, you know, related to the marks you said and kind of related a little bit to Andy as he's talking about, right, engaging in the, you know, political warfare, economic realm. Is Do we need to rethink about how SOF is, is organized, right? It's primarily organized around the operators that are full-time, right, special forces, TAB, whatever, Navy SEALs, those kind of things. And then in the support side, they come and go, right? Megan flows in as intelligence. She leaves and goes back to the conventional side. You know, same thing on the cyber realm. We don't have right, soft cyber element, right? Do we need to rethink about what it, what this, you know, what the sort, uh, you know, kind of core soft force is comprised of? Do we need to expand it or is it sufficient uh, the, the way it's kind of working right now? Yeah, look, there's a lot of things we need to do. And I, I think we do need to reorganize a little. <clears throat> I think the most important things we need to do are mental. Um, we need to free ourselves from the tyranny of the CONOP. Um, that has really emerged over the last 20 years of direct action CT. Um, and we have to think about, you know, deploying smaller teams for longer duration, you know, JEDs, um, solo cells, singletons, loan advisors. We need a, a diverse set of new skills um, and a new mix of skills within a team. Um, uh, we need ethnically appropriate SOF for the new mission set and environment. We need swing role and multi-role teams that can do multiple missions and also change uh, task mid-mission. Uh, Andy mentioned remote, remote advise and assist. Um, the ability to generate and sustain that virtual persistent presence, whether it's through the clunky current, you know, RAVAC type capabilities or the next evolution is going to be critical to generating that reach back and reach forward capability. Um, and then I think... Um, uh, I'll, I'll pick up something that uh, Megan pointed out, which is you, we need to be able to not only think about our partner forces being an indigenous G force or uh, uh, an SFA partner, but also our own GPF um, as a potential uh, training audience or partner force in a lot of the sort of gray zone type of activities that we uh, need to engage. And, and indeed, we need to be engaging with <clears throat> um, other agencies across the spectrum. Um, uh, it's probably all we need to say in this forum, but you know that obviously has very significant um, both legal and authorities implications. Yeah, David, and you had talked about you know the various um, right incurring those costs on the enemy in terms of time, space, material, and reputation. Um, what are some current you know limitations or 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 what's holding us back from doing more, right? Either, whether it's material authorities, right? What, what's impeding our ability to do more? You know, partly what you said, yeah, it's mental, but what else besides your own mind is holding us back from being able to do more? Well, I think addressing those um, <clears throat> types of uh, characteristics that I just talked about would improve our capacity uh, to deliver on uh, those kinds of activities. But I do think the biggest issue outside of just the mental issue on our side is risk aversion on the part of our politicians who have become used to a very um, structured, contained, predictable uh, type of mission set for SOF and become comfortable with that. And they need to, um, or we need to provide them with the sort of educational framework so they understand what's both possible and necessary in the operating environment that we now find ourselves in. And it isn't that defensive crouch, you know, hockey goalkeeper type model that we've applied during the, the war on terrorism. We need to be the gray zone threat in a, in, in a true sense. Right, I, I, and I, I would agree with you on the, on the concept of the risk aversion. And I actually, I use the same term, but I say, I, I take a little more nuanced approach to it. I think politicians and often senior leaders, they're short-term risk averse, which means they're long-term risk seeking unintentionally without making that intentional decision, but by not employing and taking those risks in the short term. And as you said, right, they, for the most part, policymakers weren't comfortable with soft before 9-11 and through demonstrated success. So they're 
uh, right? We've, we've demonstrated that success and their comfort, like you said, in, in some realms, but not others. So they need to em employ soft elsewhere, I guess. So um, move over to, yeah, go ahead, David. No, no, I just, I'm not famous for nuance, but <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense to me. <clears throat> All right, um, Peter, over to you. Let's uh, let, let you wrap up the, uh, the, the, the more formal part and then we can, you know, get the audience questions in here as well because I, I know they're eager to, uh, to engage. Great. Well, thank you, Liam, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me acknowledge this great panel and the fantastic perspectives today. I think what I'm about to say is going to uh, include a number of concepts that David just mentioned in his, so uh, hopefully they, they fit together well. Um, I thought about dif the different uh, avenues to embrace uh, our panel's question, but given the time constraints, I thought it best to focus entirely on the mon monograph titled Fourth Age of Soft, Use and Utility of Special Operations in the New Age, written by Will Irwin and Dr. Isaiah Wilson, circulated as a read ahead for this forum, just in case anybody um, didn't, didn't see it, it's, it's definitely worth a read, and apply complexity theory to compound security threats as a portal to understand how we could create complexity in the realm of an adversary's illegal, unreported, and unrelated, unregulated phishing. So last year, we witnessed the epitome of compound security threats and development dilemmas metastasized to an unfortunate end with the Taliban regaining control in Afghanistan after two decades and trillions of dollars of investment. Among many other conclusions from the CIGAR and elsewhere, what we didn't do in Afghanistan was treat the situation in a complex manner. It was not a military problem per se, or a diplomatic problem or a development problem. It was the upstream mental model or mindset problem. From an atmospheric view, it was the insanity principle exemplified, perhaps to its furthest reaching application. We often did the same things, magnified to the greatest extent possible and expected different outcomes. So enter complexity theory, a paradigm of science stemming back to the early Cold War that has influenced decades of Nobel Prize caliber scholarship in the integration of multiple disciplines, which include physics, economics, sociology, biology, mathematics, and ecology. I've extracted a summary of complexity theory from an MIT manuscript to help construct a workable image of what it entails. One, agents at one level are the building blocks for agents at the next level like cells, which make up organisms, which in turn make up an organ ecosystem. Two, networks include many agents gathering information who are learning and acting in parallel and in an environment produced by the interactions of these agents. Three, the system co-evolves with its environment. Four, order is emergent instead of predetermined, always unfolding and always in transition. And finally, complex systems have a future that is hard to predict. And while complexity science continues to evolve and branch out, one could take away for the purpose of this panel that the greatest application of complexity is not rethinking the strategies, campaigns, or actions, but rethinking our mindset about how to approach compound security threats and development dilemmas in entirely new ways. Let me use the following prominent example of complexity theory to build the case I'm trying to make. It's called the butterfly effect, and it comes from the 1972 research title called Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wings in Brazil Set Off a Tornado in Texas? So this, what I'm about to say, it comes from some of the research. The butterfly does not power or directly create the tornado, but the term is intended to imply that the flap of the butterfly's wings can cause the tornado in the sense that the flap of the wings is a part of the initial conditions of an interconnected complex web. One set of conditions leads to a tornado while the other, other set of conditions does not. The flapping wing represents a small change in the initial condition of the, of the system, which cascades to large scale alteration of events. So the monograph actually points on this at one point. It says jolts or course corrections on one issue have a rippling effect on several other issues. So you can let your mind run on visualizations for how our traditional, linear, cause and effect, scientific method-based engineering approach to problem solving works well in simple, even complicated situations, but have yielded lukewarm outputs at best and far worse impacts in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other enduring and complex contexts where our attempt to improve the situation is through the application of medium-term logic frameworks, targets and milestones, 
and generation of best practice and lesson learned for what is a highly adaptive and entirely unique problem set that has changed significantly since the adoption of said strategy campaign or even action was developed months or even years after the subject matter was originally synthesized, let alone occurred. As anthro-complexity expert Dr. Snowden recommends, addressing complexity is not about finding best practice, but emerging practice. To do so requires a probe, sense, respond approach to flex constraints hands-on that can propel such emergence, but with agility to amplify or dampen when needed. The monograph visualizes this paradigm well, stemming from its agents of influence principle to introduce maximin disruptions in certain illicit systems through asymmetrical approaches by, with, and through local populations that can counter adversaries with unknown, untraceable impediments that, as Sun Tzu once herald heralded, win by attacking the enemy's strategy, not necessarily its army. Shifting to illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or any natural resource extraction, much like complexity, I could cram every second of my presentation running down all the statistics related to the PRC, but instead I'll stick with one overarching visual that helps reinforce the point I want to end on. The wild, wild west of the ocean frontier has become and will continue to be better understood from a regulatory sense. Good stewardship, better data, and emerging technology can go a long way towards upholding the international rules-based order. But this will not end PRC-supported, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, however. Fishing of any kind within that sovereign exclusive economic zone falls under the jurisdiction of the respecting governing state residing over that body of water. That state controls the permits, the contracts, and the authorizations via other means that can allow a foreign distant water vessel or fleet to fish its waters. It is entirely possible that such registration enforcement and compliance be accountable and transparent. But let's not kid ourselves. Maritime domains are difficult to secure in many overseas contexts. They become victim to the out of sight, out of mind maxim. They also become favorable targets to rent seekers who can influence the political elite and its inner circle of oligarchs to construct seemingly win-win solutions without gaining much attention. The existing irregular warfare annex is clear on how to counter these type of arrangements, create new ideas within existing capacities. Take the Sandinista example from the monograph into account, you can visualize the same spear and throwing motion just with a different spearhead or direct action, one that we don't have to make at the end of the day. The monograph makes an even more critical point later on stating the following, such conditions spawn latent indigenous insurgent energy capable of challenging authoritarian governments seen as illegitimate as populations demand relief from poverty and end the corruption, greater government accountability, and increased opportunity and self-determination. It's getting the foreign rent seekers, the most prominent one, a primary adversary, out of the equation first with whatever the footprint is, as General Clark put in his keynote speech that we heard at lunchtime. As that happens and momentum builds, that indigenous energy can go after deeper constructs of transnational crime, corporate capitalism, and capital flight. And this is not just special operations strain, it's the Jim C approach, the bigger we that the monograph says can manifest integrated and rapidly formed tactical teams with global reach that exploit emergent and anticipated illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing opportunities for strategic effect. Again, that's all, that's from the monograph. So what's the bottom line? Invisibly adjust the rheostat, as Dr. Wilson said in the scene center earlier today, and adjust our own butterfly effect making to break the financial supply lines in space thought to be secured and or unknown, and do so by, with, and through actors in the local ecosystem that can expose and remove malign adversaries from their sovereign domain, disrupt their financial and natural resource supply lines, and pave the road to greater accountability, transparency, and reinforcement of the international rules-based order. That's my presentation. Thanks, Peter. I mean, that was uh, you know, pretty enlightening. And 
if you if you consider right how do we learn or where do we learn really through three mechanisms right training education and experience so if you're if you're arguing right it's more of a right the world's much more complex we have to introduce complexity right into our uh create that complexity for our rivals or our competitors where do we introduce that in terms of right how do we get that shift from that linear mode of thinking to thinking you know with complex complexity theory where do we introduce that in terms of right training education experience to change that mindset well i think uh i, I just listening to to general clark talk about counterterrorism and that not going away there's a lot of of skill and experience that's been built in that process so i think the idea is um, again, going back to the irregular warfare annex, it's doing new things with those existing capacities. And I think the other thing that General Clark had mentioned um, in, in the speech uh, during lunch was that not focusing just on the direct action itself is a lot more than that. Um, when you think of, of civil affairs, when you think of reconnaissance actions, when you think of MISO even, there's so many applications that could be applied in what I was just talking about. And again, that direct action would very well be under, undertaken by the population itself. So building Thanks. that understanding of, of an economy of scope, if you will. Thanks, right. So leveraging that experience that we've gained over the, the years of, of, of fighting these complex fights. So uh, right. appreciate that. Um, we'll go ahead. I'm going to start taking some questions from the audience. So as, as people out there have questions, go ahead and send them into the question curator or wherever you're sending them so that we can have our panelists answer them. And, and, and they don't like easy ones, so be sure to ask the, the toughest questions to them. They, they always enjoy that. Uh, I'll, I'll start off by asking that any of the panelists could be, you know, feel free to answer this. Um, what are some ways we can improve efficiency and effectiveness at defining assumed adversarial doctrine versus actual doctrine? Sounds like a G2 question. <laughs> and that's a way to pass it off right away. We'll see if Megan can uh, pass this off or if she's going to go ahead and answer this one. So um, I appreciate the question for sure, uh, as well as the pass off. Um, what, you know, I think our, the conflict that we're all observing, you know, right now has been uh, instructive for intelligence professionals at comparing you know, what we assume to be uh, adversarial doctrine versus what has played out on the battlefield. Um, and I think it's exposed, you know, so, some gaps in our knowledge and some, you know, ill-conceived assumptions um, that, you know, we just simply didn't know what we didn't know uh, at the time. Uh, so for me, you know, I think in terms of how do I improve or how can I work across a network to improve intelligence collection that would help uh, perhaps get us away from, you know, what the adversary puts out as doctrine uh, in terms of, you know, manuals and publications and white papers, and how do we get actual uh, intel collect that would verify that uh, and help us understand, you know, sort of where doctrine and reality have perhaps diverged. Thanks, Megan. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, David appreciates the answer there. I'll go ahead. This one's. This one's directed to you, David. So we'll give you the first chop at this one. So, some, someone put your name on here. So, they wanted to know: Do you hold to the merits of strategic paralysis theory? If so, how does SOF contribute? And where was this evident in the first, second, and third ages of SOF? And how do you see that its application in the fourth phase? So, pass it over to you first, and see if anybody else wants to jump in. Yeah, great question. And just for those that aren't familiar with the terminology, strategic paralysis theory is um, part of a series of concepts that developed after World War I, seeking to avoid kind of battles of annihilation and, and attrition. You know, um, uh, one variant would have been the sort of JFC Fuller pistol shot to the brain idea of Plan 1919. There are, there are subsequent um, variants of that. And of course, the, the warden... Uh, so-called five rings model of air campaigning that you know became very prominent around the first Gulf War is an example uh, of that and shock and awe is, is another example. Um, I do think that SOF has a very uh, strong relationship with strategic paralysis. 
Um, and I would point to two distinct modes in which you can um, uh, apply that. One is by posing a direct personal lethal threat to an adversary commander, right? And we often think about commanders as being primarily rational who issue an intent and then their staff works that intent. But in fact, we're all human beings. And just the notion that um, an element is out there hunting to kill the person, personally kill the, the commander can uh, impose a degree of, of irrationality or, or paranoia or uh, do things that affect uh, an adversary's uh, decision-making behavior. That's one reason, again, to use a Ukraine example, why the Russians are repeatedly sending these uh, sabotage and kill teams out onto the ground to target uh, Ukrainian leadership from President Zelensky down as a way of disrupting um, uh, the, the strategic decision-making of the Ukrainians. I'm not saying it's working, but it's certainly a, 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 an applicable model. It's certainly something we're all familiar with from the war on terrorism as well, the notion that posing a direct action threat to leadership groups within Al-Qaeda or Islamic State or Shabab, Jabhat al-Nusra, whatever, whether you do that through an air capability such as a drone or through uh, just the mere presence or risk of presence of a soft team uh, can you know, keep a guy moving, looking over his shoulder, uh, disrupt his communications and, and thereby have that sort of strategic paralysis effect. Um, I don't think that's actually played out particularly well in the case of terrorism because terrorist groups don't make decisions in the same way that a conventional adversary. But I point to a second mode that we can be very effective in, and that's posing a bandwidth challenge for an adversary's decision makers, giving them a very large number of small, dispersed, diverse challenges that they have to deal with simultaneously. And that can <clears throat> result in what um, you know, air crew talk about as task saturation, right? Where you could solve any one of these problems if you had time, but you just don't have the, the mental bandwidth. So that'd be my sort of two ways to think about how uh, soft could be applicable to that strategic paralysis model. Thanks, David. We'll go ahead. I'll, I'll toss this one out to the entire group. So we'll see who wants to take the first crack at it. But in this fourth age of soft, what emphasis should soft put on executing deterrence operations below the threshold um, of war vice training to execute core activities in a high-end fight against peer adversaries. So kind of the trade-off between, right, deterrence operations and, and prepping for that high-end fight. And then I would also add to that um, when, you're, when, when you're thinking about your answer is what, um, what are some specific things that we should do to facilitate deterrence operations? What kind of activities should we do or, or prioritize? What, what, are, what are some of the more valuable ones and what are the ones that are, hey, they're kind of nice, we've always done them, but we aren't necessarily getting the bang for the buck and we might want to reprioritize. Hey, Liam, I might jump in. Uh, also to amplify, I think, one of the things David just said. Uh, to me, um, when looking at what is the strategy that leads to victory for SOS, i.e. why a policymaker would employ them, to me, that distills down to J.C. Wiley's idea of a cumulative strategy as opposed to and in contrast to a sequential strategy. They've talked about accumulated costs and uh, also creating this, this bandwidth challenge. Um, to add a little bit of granula uh, granularity to what that means, uh, World War II Pacific Theatre against the Japanese, uh, at lunchtime, General Clark talked about uh, Volkman's guerrillas in the Philippines. That was happening at the same time that Australian commandos were fighting in Timor, holding down 10,000 odd Japanese. That was happening at the same time that the Chinese nationalist guerrillas were fighting on uh, in mainland uh, China. And it, uh, at a later stage, it was then amplified by wide-scale guerrilla warfare throughout Burma. To me, this is what a soft value proposition starts to look like when you've got all of these little pinprick activities in addition to direct action against Singapore Harbour or other uh, raids throughout the region to create a bandwidth problem that collectively accumulates to create a strategic uh, uh, problem for the adversary. The deterrence aspect of that comes through practice demonstration. 
A, that's com uh, it's uh, communicative when that type of thing is employed, but also by merely articulating it in our own doctrine, uh, you know, Megan's contemporaries in Russia and, and China will be reading that doctrine. They'll be looking at that and uh, assimilating this is what uh, Western nations are likely to do and therefore uh, uh, interpolating from that Hey, we need to be uh, we need to be preparing for that type of challenge. Over. Thanks, Anna. Anybody else want to jump in on there, Peter or David? Jump in on uh, you know where how we should balance that or or what we should be executing in terms of deterrence operations versus prepping for the high end. I just made, I just made yeah, two ahead, quick Frank. comments. Yeah, one is we just we just experienced an extremely major failure of strategic deterrence on Ukraine. And even though the administration's extremely busy trying to retcon uh, their claims that uh, they were going to effectively deter Russia, we have to recognize that that didn't work. And I think we need to be fully engaged in updating our prior assumptions about how you uh, deter a modern adversary in a gray zone, uh, great power competition context. So I'd just that's one caveat. But the other thing I would mention is that we often focus on deterrence in a uh, vertical escalation sense, right? Deterring the adversary in the main area of competition. One of the very important roles of SOF is horizontal escalation, right? Posing a threat to an adversary's assets outside the main theater of con conflict in such a way that it changes the calculus. So to, to use a Chinese example, um, any kind of direct escalation across the, the Taiwan Straits in a hypothetical future conflict rapidly runs into a nuclear threshold and that imposes deterrent limits on what our policymakers can uh, adopt. But if you were to hold assets at risk elsewhere, Latin America, Africa, uh, the South Pacific, then uh, there's a way to impose deterrence or to, to crank up deterrence without uh, tripping the potential for a, a nuclear exchange in the, in, the, uh, in the vertical escalation model. So I think thinking about how we operate outside the main theater as well as um, uh, rethinking our deterrence constructs is, is a way to, to apply that. Well, yeah. David, your first, your, oh, go ahead, Peter. Oh, I, was, I, I wanted to add to that by, um, by introducing or reminding people of the movie, The Fighter with Mark Wahlberg. I'm not sure if anybody had seen that, but, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, it's a biography on the, on the fighter. What was his name? Um, uh, shoot. Um, Mickey Ward. Sorry. Mickey Ward. And uh, you know he's get, he's in the, he's in the ring he's getting beat up round after round blow after blow taking a defense and, you know his strategy is he eventually punches him right over the kidney once once the opponent has 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 lost concentration and, and knocks him out um, so you know in the in the in the deterrence mode you know when you feel like you're on the defensive the whole time you can a small blow here and there can really trip somebody up and I think that's 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 worth considering over. Yeah, David, I was going to say the first part of your question was kind of begging a question I was going to ask, and, and, and you, you mentioned, right, deterrence clearly failed in, in, uh, against Russia and Ukraine. So what, could, what do you or any of the panelists think, what could SOF have done, that, right, in looking in hindsight, uh, if, if, you know, depending on how much knowledge you have of what we did there, or even if you don't, what do you think we could have done in terms of, uh, you know, SOF or, or maybe beyond SOF to, to help in Ukraine uh, providing a more effective deterrence against Russia? I'll start it off because it was my point and then I'll throw it to everybody else. But just very quickly, um, we had a tripwire in place for the last eight years of JSETs, um, rotational advisors, allied soft working with Ukrainian forces. And when the uh, risk of conflict began to escalate, one of the first things that the US government did was pull that tripwire out. Um, we then moved our embassy to Lviv telegraphing that we weren't going to be around in the event of a, a coup de main operation on, on Kyiv. And uh, I would argue that the people that did a little better than us but still pulled out were the Brits, who didn't actually pull their forces out, um, possibly at all, but uh, certainly until right before the conflict. And I think we, we should have recognised that obviously having a training team on the ground isn't going to necessarily stop an adversary from invading, but having that tripwire, having a, a US force 
present in theatre, uh, relatively small scale, does indeed change the calculus for an adversary who's thinking about uh, operating because it means that by definition they're going to um, possibly engage in uh, lethal action against US forces. Um, and I, I think that's that's a way to think about it. I'll throw it to everybody else. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Hey, sir, I'll, I'll add that I think there's an information component to that as well. Um, so, you know, in the lead up to the uh, actual, you know, Russia kind of crossing the line of departure into Ukraine, you know, again, uh, the administration released uh, quite a bit of classified information, previously classified information as a way to, you know, message not only to the Russians, but also to allies and partners and to chip away at the narrative that would have supported uh, Russia's, you know, uh, additional invasion into Ukraine. Um, so I, you know, I wonder what what happens if you employ those uh, techniques and uh, employ that activity further left in the timeline. Um, so, you know, at what point, you know, do you start releasing uh, strategic, you know, intelligence intercepts or things like that? Uh, not saying that it would have stopped anything, but maybe it changes uh, the Russian leader's calculus on, you know, what they do, where, and when. Thanks. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I might. Uh, to Megan's point, uh, it really demonstrates in my mind the CSBA paper released about three years ago talking about deterrence by detection. Um, and while it didn't necessarily work, there is still also the other hypothetical that's attached to that, and that is, had the United States not been rapidly declassifying information, in so doing, bringing about uh, the orchestration of NATO's interests and in so doing a very quick um, coalition of the willing, might Russia have actually achieved the fait accompli it desired of seizing uh, Kiev and, and other key cities. Um, and in that framework, while deterrence didn't work 100%, it may have worked to a... Uh, deterrence by detection may have worked to a certain extent in helping us generate the alliance that we needed at the point of crossing the line of departure. All right, I'm following up on what, you know, David, what you said, hey, we, we pretty much pulled everybody out once it became clear they weren't going in. And if we really want to understand how to best create this complexity for a current or potential rival, and we're talking during conflict, what is the panel's thoughts on, act I'm going to assume we don't have advisors there. I haven't seen, or not advisors, uh, combat observers there. I'm going to assume they aren't. So if we do have some that we're not aware of, let's assume they don't you know, make an argument of why we should accept that risk, right? You, you brought up the concept of being risk, right? Risk averse. And I say short-term risk averse, meaning, right, there is some risk with having combat observers, but in the long-term, right, we gain the benefit of, right, better understanding how they're fighting this conflict instead of watching it remotely. Um, so what are your thoughts on how, how would combat observers help us actually be more prepared uh, right for creating complexity for rivals, either in in competition or conflict. Should should we have them? And if we should, what where sh what kind of what that competition, what composition should be, and, and is it worth the risk? I guess we'll we'll go to Megan first, right? The intel side, right? So we'll we'll look at this from an intel perspective, and then we'll 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 push it over to the operator perspective, or maybe Peter, since he's. He, he, he understands the complexity theory. So Megan, over to you first, and we'll hear what Peter has to say. So, you know, I think that the benefit uh, of having combat observers, you know, or partners on the ground uh, is presenting, you know, a lot of what General Clark discussed earlier, uh, you know, kind of eyes on and, and ground truth. Um, as it is, if we are receiving information from Ukraine and we are, you know, presumably understanding things from the Russian perspective a little bit as well, uh, we have to be mindful of the biases that uh, are inherent in what they are reporting. So Ukraine is obviously incentivized to overestimate Russian casualties and the dire straits that Russia may find itself in 
while Russian commanders, uh, non-commissioned officers and officers at the junior level may be incentivized to overestimate, you know, how well they're doing or that they're okay um, or underestimate their casualties or how um, poorly things might be going. So, you know, I think that's that's always a very unique benefit that special operations forces provide uh, on the battlefield uh, as far as that ground truth, that collection that uh, can sometimes be difficult to get otherwise. Got it. Thanks, Megan. David or Andy, did you want to chime in at all on this one or not? Just to say, com you know, timing is key, right? Um, I would not be in favor of putting combat observers on the ground now, right? Um, uh, in the lead up to, to conflict, if we'd had them present and Russia invaded anyway, uh, then it's not an escalatory step. And um, having people on the ground has that tripwire effect. Putting them in now, when we're already providing weaponry uh, and intelligence support and a variety of things to, uh, to the Ukrainians is, I think, very much blurring the line between combatant or co-belligerent status. And uh, I suspect that um, you know, politicians would just not approve that uh, at this point. Thanks. All right, I got an audience question here going to anybody in the group. So intimidation is usually a factor with uh, respect to activities such as illegal fishing in, in a competition environment, especially true in the Asian nation using the Gen C plus foreign influence uh, as done in the Philippines. How do we reduce this fear? I'll take an initial stab at that, perhaps. Um, I, I mean, I think one part, one key part about this is the disruption factor, as small as it may be, can can uh, can grow and exponentially grow. Right now, we don't see much of a marker of of sort of a, a foreign uh, perpetrator of rent-seeking behavior actually get sort of kicked out, so to speak. But that, if, if, if it can happen in one place, it can happen in more. And so I think um, momentum builds on one side of that equation overall in the global South. And that could generate, begin to generate more fear of what's what's going on and what's what, what has started all of this on the other side. Over. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, um, another audience question here. Um, would you agree that knowing our adversaries order of battle, kill chain thresholds, kinetic effects, permissions and authorities would feed our ability to create meaningful complexity during competition and conflict? It's asked as a yes and no question. Obviously, I'm not gonna let you out that easy, but um, what are your thoughts on, on that question with regard to adversaries order of battle, kill chains, kinetic effects, permissions? That's sorry. Just to go first, that that's what I said when I talked about reaction. Excuse me, <clears throat> reaction parameters, right? Um, yeah, it's it is. So the answer is yes, and you absolutely need that. You need to be able to map uh, all aspects of an adversary's reaction parameters. Um, that is why having a very predictable set of publicly stated red lines on the part of policymakers from our standpoint, or having published rules of engagement is a severe weakness for us in the, uh, the, the great power competition that we're in now. Um, whereas a little bit of sort of crazy Ivan um, uh, and making ourselves unpredictable is, has a hugely protective effect. But absolutely, we need to be mapping all those elements, um, plus a few others that I mentioned in my, in my, uh, my talk. Thanks, David. Uh, this one also to anybody in the anybody on the panel. What challenges do you envision for SOFT as it reimagine or reimagines a return to supporting conventional formations? Do do SOFT leaders understand their role in operational preparation of the environment uh, and joint uh, forcible entry during large scale combat operations for the express purposes of creating points of entry for uh, conventional forces after decades of being focused on counterterrorism, direct action in foreign internal defense and, and counterinsurgency operations? Yeah, I might jump in, Liam. Um, and this ties to a certain degree to the previous question as well. You know, uh, some of the reporting uh, looking at uh, Russian logistic uh, challenges that are just inbuilt and baked in because of their uh, orbit feels a little bit like a um, like a captain's promotion course of 
you know how you how you look at a uh, order of battle and then uh, target accordingly. Um, and so springboarding off that environment into um, into today's environment, uh, I think it talks to what Dave was really meaning about imposing costs. If you've got an idea of where these limitations exist through order of battle, uh, of course, that creates your targetable critical vulnerabilities that uh, strategic reconnaissance can then be paired with a targeting solution and off we go. Um, where there's benefit from our last 20 odd years worth of uh, operational experience is becoming really, really good at the F3 AAD cycle, where those targets were quite elusive, the find bit, not to mention then fix and finish, that fine bit had a, a very large level of um, a challenge associated with it. What I think we're uh, not talking about enough is how that um, familiarity with targeting cycles has actually improved our ability for soft uh, SR effects to be doing the find and fix for those targetable critical vulnerabilities within an enemy's conventional order of battle. Thanks, Andy. I guess I'll ask, I asked this question of Peter earlier, so, uh, you know, hit, hit, see what the other panelists think on it, but you know, to, to, to get to what some of the things that we talked about and discussed today or in this panel for the last hour or hour plus, what, what changes should we make out, you know, the easy, right? Maybe training and education. What, what kind of, what, what fundamental changes should we be making there or what small changes should we make there? To be better prepared to introduce this complexity, right? Do we need to teach some, introduce something in the in the soft curriculum somewhere, right? In the you know the basic courses, right? The special forces qualification course, or uh, you know, kind of mandate into training better. I mean, what what kind of changes should we do there as opposed to right other organizational changes that we can make? So I, I mentioned a few already, but I might add to the ones I already mentioned if that's okay. Um, yep. So, you know, I talked about ethnically appropriate teams, smaller teams, longer duration, um, swing role, multi-role. Um, I'd also mention that we need to be able to operate at distance to a degree that we haven't done for 20 years, right? Um, and uh, with the exception of, of SOC Africa um, and to a lesser extent SOC PAC, we've been in relatively short range operations. And I think we need to be thinking about how do we deploy those very small teams at extreme ranges and still maintain uh, connectivity? And then we can be looking at um, design, um, particularly the ability to um, do improvised capabilities using things like advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, a uh, variety of capabilities that are out there now. Uh, we need to be become more familiar and, and better at using um, autonomous systems as a sort of amplified support network, whether they be underwater uh, surface or air systems as kind of a, um, a force augmentation aspect for a small team operating forward. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how much we need to focus on air ground integration and SF JTACs as a critical element of basically everything we do. And then the final point, uh, two more points, um, one very specific and one more general. We, we've got to recognize that space is now a war fighting domain, which means that reliance on TACSAT and GPS and um, you know, a variety of, of other capabilities uh, may not be smart. And you know, my, my first JSET as a young captain working with Indonesian SOF, we had a HF carrier wave, um, Morse code rear link, right? And, uh, we're looking at things like tropo scatter, um, re returning to UHF, whole variety of different means to be able to, if you like, fight unplugged when space-based systems go down. And I think in any uh, great power competition environment, we have to be planning on that. And then the final one, which is sort of kind of a bit subtle, but I would just say we need to focus more, and, and Will has done some great work on this already at, at JSAL, but we need to focus on support to resistance movements, which is subtly but significantly different from um, and dramatically broader than support to a G chief or a guerrilla force. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all very familiar with it's sort of comfort zone um, working with guerrilla forces, but a civil based resistance movement, for example, requires 
very different capabilities and skill sets on our part to be able to be effective in working with them. Thanks, David. I'll give it a, you know, if, if, if Peter or Megan or Andy, if, if any of you want some closing remarks, short closing remarks to make to the, uh, the audience before we wrap it up, I guess, starting with Peter, if you've got any uh, closing remarks for the panel. Uh, I, I, I don't really. I think uh, David's, David's comments just there. He, he sort of st stole any thunder I could provide here at the end. So I'll leave oh, that. <laughs> no, I agree entirely with that. Yeah, the, the lesson, don't don't ever follow David, right? There Megan you. or Andy, do you have any, anything you to wrap up with? <laughs> no, I just want to say thanks. Uh, I learned uh, just as much as I hopefully contributed. Uh, and to close, I think uh, organizationally, to answer your last question, Liam, uh, the, the aspect of uh, selection courses into SF have become a little sacrosanct, uh, perhaps to our detriment. I, I question whether today's TE Lawrence would, would pass Hell Week or not, um, uh, probably in the negative. Over. All right, thank you. I want to, you know, thank the panelists for their time they spent today and, and really kind of, you know, a lot of things are brought up, but a lot of it, right, hyper, hyper interagency coordination, right, partnering with the coalition forces and kind of brought out repeatedly today that it's really soft out there operating independently and it's with partners either in government, in the military or, or with, with partner nations. So thanks to the audience as well for, for contributing and participating in the discussion. Thank you, Colonel Collins and panelists for that excellent commentary and discussion.